Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's six o'clock. We've got a whole bunch of people signed up for this tonight. So we're just going to kind of wait here for a few minutes. Probably start here about 6.02, 6.03, just to make sure enough people um, get, get a chance to log in. Okay, Steve, I think it looks like our attendees have leveled off a little bit. Okay, right on. Great. We'll start right now then. Um, so welcome everyone. Um <clears throat> a lot of people tonight, and I'm kind of happy for that. So my name is Steve Caramile. I'm the inland fish program manager here at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So Tonight's meeting is going to be, you know, mostly informational. Our, we're going to be talking about the development of our resident native trout harvest management policy. And what I'm going to be sharing with you is the approved scope and the development timeline. So there's not really a, a lot of meat here on the policy to comment on yet. It's, it's really just a bunch of uh, bullets at the moment. So this is really an informational contact point for us to be transparent about what we're developing and kind of talk about the process, um, when we'll have more for you all to review and when and how the public can provide um, more comment and input. <clears throat> so, you know, again, the, the primary goal of this meeting will be to share information about the scope, development and timeline of this new policy, which is gonna apply to resident native rainbow trout and cutthroat trout and their subspecies, including coastal cutthroats, west lobe cutthroats, uh, Columbia River red bands and coastal rainbows. This policy is not gonna address um, native hatchery origin trout. So none of our hatchery rainbows or our hatchery cutthroat. It's not gonna address uh, non-native trout or char species. It's not gonna address bull trout or Dolly Varden, or any of the anadromous life histories of any of those species. And, you know, we already have some plans that, that cover some of these. So remember that bull trout already have a recovery and management plan. Um, Non-native species are already covered under the non-native game fish and fisheries policy. And steelhead harvest and management is already covered under a, a whole entire separate process. So I've got a presentation here, uh, 16 slides. It's going to cover all the topics that are here on the screen. Um, it should take roughly 15 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. So what I'm going to do is I'll walk through the introductions of the others that are here on the screen, on, on the call with me tonight. We'll go over why we're developing this policy. Um, we'll talk about the direction that we're given by the commission. 
and a little about the initial stab at the general bulletized content that we have. And then at, at the end, I'm going to share our development schedule and the multiple touch points that we're going to have for comment, you know, along the way before we move into kind of a, a really focused Q&A session at the end. So for the introduction, so besides myself, um, there's going to be seven others that are going to be working on this draft policy with me. So Kurt Hughes, uh, the fish management division manager, um, you can probably see him on your screen here somewhere. Good evening. And then uh, the regional fish program managers, we have six of them. So Chris Donnelly from Spokane, Chad Jackson from Afreda, both of those guys are here tonight. Trevor Hutton out of Yakima. Trevor's not here on the screen tonight. And then there's Edward Eliezer from Mill Creek, Bryce Glasser from Ridgefield, and James Losey from Montesano. Uh, and then just one last thing. I mean, we may not answer everyone's questions tonight. Um, if there's anything that we don't answer, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to one of us. Um, we'll answer what we can. And, uh, you know, if there's things that people can't answer, they can forward those on to me and I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, so for background. So back in August, um, the Fish and Wildlife Commission received a petition from the public asking them to undertake rulemaking to provide statewide protection of the resident forms of wild steelhead. And to provide this statewide protection, the petitioners offered you know, these four rules here at the bottom of the screen. So statewide year round catch and release and selective gear rules for all size wild trout in rivers and streams for all the watersheds with wild steelhead. And then they also offered up closed waters and sec uh, selected sections of rivers designated as wild steelhead gene banks and closed waters in watersheds with wild steelhead runs that were uh, under escaped. Nope, wrong way. Uh, the petitioner stated that um, these rules were needed because our current rules uh, were insufficient at protecting native trout. And our current rules were developed from our basic stream management strategy that's provided the basis for all our resident management and streams since uh, mid-80s, 1984. Um, and, and this strategy is almost identical to that used by Oregon and Idaho. And that process laid out in that strategy is, is still pretty you know, important and relevant to us today. So looking at our, our trout management and streams, uh, the department currently manages those trout fisheries with multiple regulations. You know, our, our statewide rule is an eight inch minimum with a two fish limit. But you know, especially in areas with steelhead, we have rules that provide uh, a significant amount of protection uh, for steelhead while providing some opportunity. So we do have a lot of closed areas, you know, especially I'm thinking, you know, a lot of the like upper Yakima where there's a lot of bull trout, we've, we've got a lot of closed areas down in the, the Southeast as well. We have areas where it's uh, catch and release, release all wild rainbows. We have a lot of areas with a 14 inch minimum that allows for multiple years of spawning. And then our general stream rules also have a season that's Saturday before Memorial Day um, to October 31st. And, and that helps limit interactions with adults and outmigrants. So, you know, after the commission meeting in, in October, um, you know, or at the commission meeting, um, staff recommended that the Fish and Wildlife Commission deny the petition um, staff didn't really feel that the rules requested by the petitioner really accounted for the sophistication and complexity or protection of our current rules. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Commission agreed and directed staff to develop a policy that provides high level guidance as to how we manage the harvest of resident native trout. So the next 
five slides are uh, some of the sections that we're going to be including in the draft, as well as some of the topics that we might cover. So purpose and background. Um, the first two bullets here are the ones that to me are pretty important and will be used to develop uh, the main purpose statement of the policy, which is probably going to be something kind of like that statement that's there at the top of the slide. Um, so it's going to provide clear and concise guidance as to where, when, and how uh, we'll manage recreational fishing impacts on resident native trout species. And then the second bullet, of course, is, you know, I've already talked about this, what it's going to address and what it's not going to address. So it's going to address native, it's not going to address native or non-native char species, non-native trout, or native hatchery origin trout. And then some of the other bullets that are, you know, down here closer to the bottom of the screen, those are going to kind of help inform the background of what we currently do. Uh, the information we currently have and provide some, you know, history on our trial rule process. I think the the intent of the policy is going to be pretty clear. Uh, I think these three bullets are um, probably almost what it's going to say. Uh, you know, the intent of the policy is going to be to meet the conservation needs of resident native trout. Um, the intent of the policy is going to be to provide guidance to staff and address the interests of recreational anglers who fish for resident native trout species. And it's going to provide statewide consistency in our approach to implementing rules that are easily understood by the public. Okay, the guidelines. This is um, some of the draft sideboards for the development of the policy. And this is going to um, guide what the policy will do. And so to kind of paraphrase, you know, all of these bullets into, into something fewer, um, it's going to acknowledge that both rainbow and cutthroat exhibit diverse life history strategies, all of which provide some contribution to each other. And, and we know that. It's going to conserve native resident trout species using a conservative approach with appropriate rules. Uh, it will be consistent with state laws, rules, policies, and conservation plans. And it's going to use a science-based approach to decision-making and management that is within our available budget. What it's not going to do, um, we're not going to be developing a management plan or a white paper that's got a lot of rigid specificity to it. Um, what we're going to be doing is creating a policy that provides high level guidance to the harvest management of our resident native trout species. Oh, this section to me is kind of about how we're going to organize the policy. So are we going to be defining elements of the policy around habitat types or areas that have certain management objectives? Um, <clears throat> my guess is that it'll be a little bit closer to what we see in the last bullet, where we're organizing the policy elements based on habitat types like rivers or and or lakes or areas that are um, in the anadromous zone or above the anadromous zone and then from there we'll be developing separate pol excuse me separate policy statements that guide harvest management within those areas Uh, fishing regulations. Uh, this is a hard one for me. Um, I don't think we're going to be suggesting specific regulations. Um, in, in my mind, we can't see all of the 
possible future scenarios and issues. And I don't know that we want to be locked down in a policy to only a few prescribed tools. So again, I think the policy is meant to provide um, some high level guidance. So maybe what it will do is go into types of regulations that may be appropriate for a certain situation, or maybe it will talk about what type of information is required when changing a rule or when it's appropriate to change rules. Okay, and then the last couple of slides here is gonna be on our timeline. So, uh, you know, we, we went to the Fish and Wildlife Commission in uh, October. I think that was early October, around the 10th or 14th or something like that. And that's when they directed us to develop a policy. Um, so we started in November um, developing a draft scope and as well as this uh, uh, draft timeline. Um, we had that approved by the Fish Committee back before the holidays in December and then reached out to the tribes in January to invite their involvement. And we plan to be finished um, with the policy in hopefully September 2025. So, you know, again, we're at really at the beginning of, of this process. Um, you know, tonight is just our, our first in initial reach out to the public just to share this timeline in the, in the scope. And so you see, we've only crossed the first three things off the list and we're there at the arrow um, tonight with, uh, with town hall number one. Um, so looking at opportunities uh, to comment in the future, uh, we've got another um, two more town hall meetings currently scheduled to uh, give the public time to provide comment. Um, and we also have the SEPA process there in March of 2025. The SEPA process will is usually uh, followed by, well, I think for this, it'll probably be a 30 or a 45 day comment period. Um, and then we also have um, public comment during the August 2025 uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting. So, you know, looking at the next town hall in June of 24 here, that's, you know, six months away, roughly. Um, I'm thinking that it's going to be kind of a similar format to tonight. Uh, we'll have a an initial draft policy that we'll present to the public. Um, it'll have a lot more meat on the bones than anything that you saw tonight. It'll probably be a little bit more full, uh, but still, you know, in draft form. Um, We'll have a Zoom meeting uh, with a briefing followed by a short Q&A. And then we'll probably direct people to provide comments online at our public input portal so we can capture comments a little bit more accurately. Um, I think that is it. So that's it for the presentation. Um, remember that the primary goal of tonight's meeting was to pretty much just share information about the scope, development and timeline, you know, what it is that we're going to be doing. And yeah, I realize, you know, again, there's not really a lot of meat on this yet, but you at least, at least you know what direction we're going in, um, what it is we're trying to cover. So for tonight, I mean, we still want to have a, a bit of a you know, Q&A session. So I think first what we'll do is um, we're going to open up and see if anyone has any questions on the timeline itself or how maybe how to provide public input um, now and in the future. Okay, and just a reminder to raise your hand. There's a reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. It might also be a raise hand button depending on the um, Zoom you're running. And if you are on telephone, you can raise your hand dialing star nine. Looks like we have a hand from Sergio. Sergio, go ahead. Hi, uh, I have a quick question. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. 
um, sorry, it was not clear. Does it uh, the policy uh, would affect also lakes or is mostly streams? Um, it will apply to um, lakes where we definitely have wild trout. We definitely have those in some of our lakes. So, but it's not going to apply to hatchery trout within lakes. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, so are there any questions on the scope of the policy as we presented it? It looks like we have a few hands for that one. Our first hand is from Kurt. Kurt, go ahead. Evening, guys. Good to see you, Steve, and the rest of the department employees. Hey, Kurt, how are you? Oh, doing okay for an old fart. Good. And you're pitching, trying. Um, you know, this, you know, lacks a lot of detail, but there, I think there's three major potential conflicts that needs to be examined. And the first, of course, is, you know, you probably remember following the 84, 85 stream strategy effort, there was a backlash that resulted in a, uh, prohibiting the state to ban bait in any stream and we didn't have uh, river specific information on. And the last time I researched that was in the late 90s, and was, that, that law was still on the books. I have no idea what the status of that is. But I'm assuming something we do with um, uh, curtailing some of the harvest will involve bait bans. You know, I, I think, you know, the, an EAS listing of, of, of a fish in the basin, you know, anatomous fish, would probably get us around that, that law, but it might uh, be more difficult in some waters above anatomous barriers. Just, you know, and I, I don't know the status of that, but that would be something that I think needs to be researched. So, Kurt, maybe um, this is Kurt. I'll touch on that just briefly. You know, you're familiar with it as I am probably more so, uh, but you might recall that that bait ban was um, brought on by a, a wholesale uh, application of a, of a no bait rule. And the, the law itself actually prohibits us from um, making that sort of broad brush application of a rule uh, of that nature. So if there was something where we had uh, um, a reason, which we we currently do in practice, to apply like, um, uh, you know, a selective gear rule or some specific rule in uh, much more um, strategic or more um, surgical manner, then um, that law doesn't affect the application of the rule. It was when it was a broad brush across the board, this is what we're going for. So I think there's some flexibility around it, but keep in mind that um, as we do go forward, we'll be paying attention to things like that and, and having review from our attorney general, assistant attorney general, um, for how the policy connotes with, uh, with state law that's already out there. So yeah, it's just That's my helpful. recollection, which which always is a little bit foggy, um, was that you needed specific information on on the river where you're going to apply the regulation. Um, you know, I agree that what you're suggesting is, is the same way of doing, but I'm not sure that the law that was enacted in '85, I think, is the same approach to it. Anyway, something needs to be checked. Uh, a concern it's of mine will be, you know, a crying need in in steelhead country and and. Um, is the importance of, of those resident rainbows as population um, buffers and, and uh, stability for the steelhead populations. And so whatever we do is gonna have to include that. And almost by necessity, we will require bait bands in, in the, to ensure that those fish have a chance to spawn multiple times. In North Sound, my, the scales I've looked on on resident uh, rainbows in you know the North Sound rivers is that 14 inch minimum would do an at, a fair job of protecting through the first spawning, but it would do almost nothing for the second spawning. Second spawning fish were normally up around 15, 16 inches in length. If we want to do that, you almost have bait, which is going to immediately put you in conflict with the salmon fishing. Um, and you know, at some point in time, we're going to have to. Uh, and I realize this is a tough ask from the Department of Salmon. But we're going to have to put some from some resources above um, 
accessing salmon. And if, if you know, if a river with, you know, a bait ban when we don't have a salmon fishery and then and then allow bait when the salmon fishery comes becomes self-defeating and, and negates almost all the advantage of it. Not going to be popular. It's going to be a tough sell. I, I, I encourage you to take that on, but um, it just that's the reality of the situation. And, and you know, if, if we don't go all in, you know, we're we're not doing the job and protecting the resource. And you mentioned the tribal input. Uh, and that can put you in conflict in, in native trout in, say, Lake Warshan, Lake Sammamish, places like that where we have uh, uh, native trouts that probably need protection and, and tribal interest in actually, actually persecuting the same trout. Um, and I don't know how you're going to make that call, but that's going to be a, a difficult one. And I just throw those three out as, as um, issues that need to be uh, researched, thought about, and try to address on a large scale. Thanks. Thanks, Kurt. Nice to hear from you. Yeah, good to hear from you guys. Take care. You too. Our next hand is from Stacy. Stacy, go ahead. Stacy, I have just prompted you to unmute. Okay. Stacy, I think we don't have them. Okay, Kurt. I mean, sorry, Steve. That is all of them. That's Looks all. like Stacy's hand's still up. So, Stacy Chick. Um, I think that's just because I hadn't put it down yet. They hadn't put it down either. I'm gonna lower it, and if you can figure out your unmute, you can raise your hand again. We have another hand from Guy. Guy, go ahead. Hey, Steve and everybody, thank you for uh, doing doing this. So one of the things you asked was what we can do to continue this in terms of uh, information exchange. And I think a website that has sort of the progress and a place to enter comments would really be handy. Um, it would follow some of the other town hall meetings we've been participating in. So that'd be really a nice uh, feature to have to help with the outreach and the information exchange and getting public comment. Thanks. So, yep. So Guy, thanks for that. So um, yeah, I kind of touched on that a little bit in our, in um, uh, the slide here where I was talking about opportunities for comment, you know, right now there's not a, there's not a lot on this. Right. And I think what, um, as we get something drafted, that's, that's what we're going to do. Um, after our next town hall, we're definitely going to do that. Have a, our public input website up where people can provide, um, you know, some comment and some input on the on the initial draft and when we actually get it going. Mm -hmm. But we'll do that. Yeah, and, and obviously what's going to show up in this process is the need for some resources to help us modern understand some of the data needs. And so that's where we need to sort of put that out and anything anything we can do to help you guys get that, those resources would be great to recognize early on so we can help you get those resources. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. Our next hand is from Jerry. Jerry, go ahead. Okay, Jerry, I have prompted you to unmute. Got it. Thank you very much. There you go. Hey, hey, I just want to stress that that you know this outreach effort, and I I appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, most of these folks have not gone to uh, college; they haven't uh, to to study biology. Uh, so there needs to be an education piece of this, um, especially around the an anatomous uh, features of the resident trout and how. Um, some of those those streamside trout can actually go ocean going, and and uh, that's that's our our steelhead gene pool. Uh, so don't overlook the education opportunities in this process, um, and that'll help inform a, a better public decision. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Our 
And next is Sandy. Sandy, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Sure can. All right, great. Uh, all right, first of all, I appreciate uh, you doing this presentation and the opportunity to, to comment here. And, uh, you know, on one of your slides, you pointed out how native uh, rainbow trout can, and the uh, anadromous version, which is steelhead, how they contribute to each other. Well, I think it's stronger than that. They can be absolutely critical. Uh, the native rainbow trout can be critical to the survival of uh, the anadromous steelhead, especially in those lean years and in those years when uh, it's majority a female steelhead returning. The male native rainbow trout uh, interbreed with the uh, anadromous version to keep the run going. There have been studies in both the Columbia system and the Skagit system that support that. So I just wanted to emphasize that it's more than just contributing to each other. It can The native rainbows can be absolutely critical to the survival of a, a steelhead. And Kurt alluded to that when he talked about buffering the uh, the wild steelhead. So I just hope you take that into account in your policies. And I'm specifically thinking of a, a river like the North Fork of the Stillaguamish. And there you don't have any conflict with uh, salmon fishing. So maintaining a catch and release on all native trout in the Stille is a, is a good thing to do and not allowing any harvest at all. So. Again, those are my comments, so thank you very much. Thanks, Sandy. Our next and last hand is from James. James, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Sure, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. My, my home water is the Upper Columbia, so we're behind uh, Grand Coulee Dam. And we primarily go for the the red bands, the wild red bands. And it, obviously, we don't have ocean going trout <laughs> because of the dam. Would your policies affect us, even though we don't have like we we believe these are the steel the steelhead stock, but they don't they can't get past the dam. So, so I'm wondering if our water will be, so the upper Columbia before it goes into Canada, so above the dam, above Grand Coulee Dam, will that be included in the scope of your, uh, you know, action here? Yeah, sure it will. I mean, um, especially up there, yeah, we've got red band populations. We have wild red band populations. So this mm -hmm. is going to be um, governing how we harvest uh, our 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 resident rainbow trout, which the red bands up there are are part of that. Okay, perfect. Well, it's good to hear that. Yeah. James, what's your concerns up there? Um, well, we, I'm a very avid uh, fly fisherman, and I have some guide friends that we fish together, and we've been noticing, not just on our side of the border, but up in Canada, because we fish it from like Castlegar down, we've been seeing a decline and I'm not sure why. And we we primarily uh, practice catch and release. I don't, I'm not sure <laughs> what all the reasons for the decline are. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like steelhead. If you talk to any steelhead guide, he's going to disagree with the other guide about why this is happening, different things. So we don't, I'm not totally sure why, but we just, it's such a valuable fishery up there just want to make sure that we steward it well. And when you say decline, do you mean decline in mean size or in catch rate? Both. Yeah, it's uh, it's some people are blaming it on the sturgeon, but I have a friend, Bill Baker, who uh, is the our wildlife guy, fish and wildlife guy up here, and he says there's not that many. Like there's exaggerated amounts of sturgeon being released. I don't know in Canada how many they have, but how, how much they had in Canada. But um, the the guys who fish for for uh, 
primarily fly fishers, uh, fishing for the, the red bands. And so from, from the border up to Castlegar and we're basically from the border down around Northport. We've seen a lot of decline in numbers and size. So that's yeah, amazing. so that's an amazing that's, result. Yeah, just real quick, you know, um, some challenges that we have there, James, is that you know, overall production of rainbows in the Canadian reach of the upper Columbia has gone up considerably and in, in Canada has increased their harvest rules over time. Um, I think it's up to, it's either three or five adult fish daily that are allowed up there. So you're probably seeing some of that impact. Um, but, you know, as we get into this, those red bands will be considered in these rules and we can look at, you know, how, what's appropriate there as well. So um, what you're noticing isn't something that we haven't noticed up there. So I appreciate the feedback. But you've seen that too, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, there's still some really large fish up there. <clears throat> oh, there are. I every <laughs> every year I have a few that just straighten my hooks, and yeah. I never even I never even see them. They're so big. And if you're not aware of it, and since there's not a lot of hands up, I'll take a little more time. Um, we do quite a bit of work up there. We've got index populations in Onion Creek and in, in Big Sheep, so we know juvenile and adult production up there, and, and we can look at mean size and mean age. So. Um, we have enough information up there to make some pretty good decisions. Excellent. Well, I appreciate it. Um, I'll try to stay in, in in the conversation, but I appreciate what you guys are doing. Yeah, and, and Bill will keep you up to speed as well. Okay, yeah. I see him all the time. Uh, he goes to my church. <laughs> so, all right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks, James. Our next hand is from Rich. Rich, go ahead. Hi, thanks for uh, allowing me to provide input on this uh, really important issue. Uh, I'd really like to thank the department of staff and, and the commission for um, going in this direction and really trying to do something um, that can potentially benefit the fish. Um, you know, again, I hope that you all look at this as really being an opportunity rather than just a chore. Uh, I really believe that there's something that we can do better from a conservation standpoint. And when you look at the landscape, it's a lot different than it was 40 years ago when some of the policies were put into place 40 years ago. And we really need to be thinking about that. Things have changed. We have ESA listings in many of the DPSs. And well, we the science has come to um, tell us a lot more information regarding uh, resident form of omicus and its uh, abilities to be an important life history component of wild steelhead and our wild steelhead populations have declined over the years and it's just a really critical life form that can help you know and when we have a bad ocean environment and and other things we we need to do everything we can do to to help those fish in the places and things that we can do that we can actually control. Um, you know, and again, you know, the same thing. It's it's Ciron cutthroat and resident cutthroat. You know, they all play an important role in each other's uh, um, survival and capacity and abundance. And uh, I'm actually surprised that we didn't really consider the bull trout, uh, especially the Nadris form of bull trout. Um, you know, similar, some similar life histories there. And I think we really should reevaluate that. Um, so I really hope that you take this, you know, as a really important thing that it is an opportunity for us to do something better and potentially help the fish. So I appreciate your time. Thanks again. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. And that was our last hand for now. Okay. And just a reminder for those on the phone, it is star nine to raise your hand. For everyone else on the computer, depending on the Zoom you're, you have, it might look like a smiley face that says um, reaction or a raise hand. It looks like a little high five. It looks like Stacy's hand is back up. 
Stacy, go ahead. Hey there, can you hear me this time? Oh, sure. Yeah. Can. There you go. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I don't know what happened before. Hey, um, so my question is kind of along the lines of, and yeah, thanks for doing this. This is great. Uh, my question is along the lines of the gentleman that was the first question um, before the scope, but I think it really was a scope question is um, about hatchery trout. And, and you said this will not apply to hatchery trout. Um, how are we going to, how are folks that are fishing, how are they going to be able to tell hatchery from native? That's that's a great question. Um, well, Steve, I mean, I think we start with our wild salmon and policy in 2000, essentially, you know, eliminated stocking hatchery trout in streams. And there are a few that drop out of lakes. Um, but for the most part, if you are encountering a trout in a stream, that's a wild origin trout. Um, so that's one way we do it. Um, in some of our other places where we have large populations of wild trout, like Lake Roosevelt, we fish mark selective no different than we do with coho and Chinook fisheries in Puget Sound or the ocean. <clears throat> so, you know, we've kind of separated those populations. Um, I don't know, Steve, did, did you want to go deeper into what we could potentially do with other trout, hatchery trout populations? I mean, um I mean, there's, there's, well, I don't know that I want to go too deep into that because it's kind of a rabbit hole. Um, we can, but there are definitely things that we can possibly do with other hatchery trout populations. It's, it's just, uh, you know, once again, this whole thing talked about within available budget. I mean, if we have to start marking all of our hatchery trout, it's going to cost us a fortune, but it's something that we might be able to, to, uh, to do. But, you know, once again, we've got a lot of, um, so as as Chris kind of alluded to, you know, the vast majority of our uh, streams, you know, we it's it's all it's all wild trout, right? Um, right. <clears throat> we do have residualized steelhead smolts in certain places, and we have rules on those in terms of we'll have to look at that inside this policy. You know, we've used a conservation rule places where we have say mitigation summer steelhead that we stock in the snake basin where we allow harvest of hatchery marked trout across the summer period because they didn't migrate out. Um, so there's some challenges we have there. But when I think about the number of places where wild trout occur, where we stock hatchery trout in lakes, it's a pretty small subset. And the bulk of the ones that I can think of occur in region four. Um, and it's coastal cutthroat that migrate in in the fall and over the top of our trout fisheries. And it could be as simple as a change in closure dates or or something to avoid those interactions or in this case of many of those populations they're probably healthy enough to withstand some harvest but we'll have to sort that out and we haven't put a lot of thought to it yet um, with that specific question Stacy but it's been one that I've thought about how we'd handle and I don't have the silver bullet in my mind yet okay no thanks Chris Thanks, Stacy. And that was the last hand. If there's any lingering questions or comments? I'm not seeing any, Steve. Okay. Well, great. Well, I, you know, I want to, uh, first of all, you know, thank everyone for showing up tonight. Um, I was surprised actually to see uh, as, as much um excitement i guess for uh for trout i mean this definitely isn't a salmon thing we see a lot of salmon people uh, showing up to these meetings i was kind of surprised to see how many people signed up for this so um you know once again you know going back to our schedule um you know if we you know those of us are going to be working on this uh for the next you know six months um and we're hoping to have something you know in front of the public again um for some time in June. So, um, you know, you guys all got the, excuse me, the email for this meeting, uh, start, you know, keep your eyes open for the next uh, email and for the next town hall meeting. And we hope to have it, you know, a lot more in front of you guys to, um, to review and comment on. So once again, thanks for taking, you know, an hour or so out of your evening to hang out with us tonight.
Good night.